Hi, this is Clyde Wallace for the Guilford Dragon News. Today, I'm talking to Professor Chris Rapley, a former director of the British Antarctic Survey and of the Science Museum in London. Chris is now Professor of Climate Science at University College London. Widely recognized for his contribution to climate science, in 2008, he was awarded the Edinburgh Science Medal for, quote, professional achievements judged to have made a significant contribution to the understanding and well-being of humanity. He's also made his mark in the theater. In 2014, on commission from the Royal Court Theater, he wrote and performed in a one-person play on climate science called 2071. On top of all this, he just happens to be a longtime resident of Guilford. So Chris, thanks very much for taking the time to talk to us today. Now, most of what we hear about the climate emergency tends to focus on the global big picture, or at least on those parts of the world where its impacts are already being felt. Given that our local experience is mainly warmer summers and milder winters right now, can you outline some of the more problematic consequences that we're likely to experience in Surrey in the future? Okay, well, it's actually quite difficult to disentangle the, the global and the, and the local, but I agree with you, most people's lived experience hasn't, other than seeing stuff on TV, you know, fires in California and floods elsewhere, it hasn't really struck home uh, to people's daily lives yet, unless you happen to be living in Yorkshire at present, where of course you're, you're beginning to see the kind of flooding event that the climate science community has been predicting will become more common for years. So extreme heat waves uh, will become more common, uh, extreme wind events, uh, rain, extreme rainfall, uh, a warmer atmosphere can carry more moisture. And so it does two things, where it extracts the moisture from the land, it makes it drier, so you get more droughts, that will affect agriculture. And then when it deposits it, it, te it tends to do it in much more intensive um, events. So you can get flash flooding and so on, which is uh, obviously very dangerous. We had one person die a week ago by being swept away by, um, by you know, flash flood water. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, we also know that the, the winds around the Arctic which uh, up until recently have, it's called the polar vortex, they, they contain the very cold air that is up there. Those winds are weakening and becoming less stable. And so every so often and increasingly we see incidents where large amounts of cold air from the Arctic come down over mid-latitudes, seen them in the United States, in Siberia. We've had a couple of experiences of it here in Europe. And at the same time, warm air wafts up over the Arctic, doing more melting. So we're seeing stuff happen around the world. It just hasn't quite happened in Guildford yet. Can you, for context, remind us what needs to be done at the global level to reduce the impacts of climate change? <clears throat> yeah, abolish fossil fuels. <laughs> That's clear. <laughs> yeah, sure. And, 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 and let me explain that. You, you hear a lot about, you know, you hear a lot of technical terms, net zero, you hear a lot about trajectories. We need to reduce our emissions by, you know, 45 or 50 percent by 2040. <clears throat> but actually, it's very simple. We need to abol abolish fossil fuels. So, and, and don't get me wrong, um, you know, I, the, the energy supply that fossil fuels have provided have completely transformed the lives of everybody that's, well, pretty much everybody that's alive today, perhaps not the people sleeping on the streets on Guildford High Street and outside the station, but most of us lead uh, extraordinarily, um, uh, you know, wonderful lives in terms of um, uh, the, the quality of life that we have. So, so the energy supply that fossil fuels have provided has been remarkable. Um, but what we've come to see is that they have a downside. Um, somebody said to me the other day, um, well, you know, it's, uh, it's a... Um, uh, it, it's not a supply side issue, it's a demand side issue. It's not the fossil fuel company's fault that people use their products. Uh, it's, you know, that would be like blaming farmers for obesity. Uh, and, and, and no, sorry, uh, you know, if, if the farmers were supplying people with poisoned food and had known that for 30 years while they were doing it, then the analogy might hold. So what we have is a, is a product which is doing damage and it's going to do ever more serious damage in the future to the point where if we're not careful, and perhaps we'll get onto that, uh, we could lose control, the planet could move on to a state that would be really serious, I mean existential for billions of people. So we need to abolish them and we, and we need to see fossil fuels for what they are. And, and the abolitionists didn't say we'll reduce slavery by 20%, by 1820 and 30% by whatever. They said slavery is, is an abomination. It violates 
fundamental ethical and moral uh, uh, tenets. And we should see fossil fuels in the same way. They violate our uh, well-being and we should eradicate them. Having accepted that absolute, we then can have an adult discussion about how we do that in a way that doesn't allow the wheels to come off in the meantime, because it's not simple. It's been said that only a very significant upheaval in our lifestyles will enable us to meet targets on carbon reduction. If we're to bite the bullet, what changes do we need to make? The, just the first thing to say is that the upheaval that we'll have to go through, if we want to call it an upheaval, is nothing to the upheaval that we risk if we don't do it. Um, and I don't think that is fully understood. Um, and, and, and often I've seen cost-benefit analyses done where the costs of the change are, are addressed, but, but the costs of not having the change are not addressed. And that simply gives you the wrong answer. You, ha you have to see what is coming down the railway line uh, if you don't make these changes. But yes, uh, I mean, th th there will be technocratic solutions. You know, there will be, we've seen it already, solar PV and wind, the prices have plummeted, they're cost competitive with fossil fuels. It's driving the coal industry um, uh, into um, collapse, which is great. Um, and the same will happen in the end for oil and gas. Um, there are technocratic solutions, but they won't be sufficient. We have to go right back to first principles. And it's, it, it's partly about the way that we live all of the usual stuff about um, reducing as much as we can our dependence on energy uh, and certainly fossil fuel energy. Um, but things like eating less meat, uh, which, you know, there are all sorts of co-benefits in terms of health, you know, walking, riding, eating less meat. Uh, there, there, are, there are many, many benefits. The air quality improves as we shift to the new regime. You know, who wouldn't want um, that kind of lifestyle? Um, but uh, there, there are deeper issues. And as a physicist who's done a lot of work studying the planet from space, um, you, you see very clearly that it's a finite uh, resource. And the idea that you can have infinite growth is obviously insanity, stupid. And so that has to change. So when you say there have to be big changes, we have to change the way that we power, finance and govern the planet. And that's not easy. Many will consider the changes you're talking about to be inconvenient at best and, uh, and a reduction in their quality of life at the worst. So what would you say to them? Well, I, I just go back to my other point. You know, if, if you think that's bad, just wait and see what happens if we continue the way we are. And, 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 uh, but, but, but that, so that's true. But actually, um, you know, I, I've never understood why organizations focus only on their risk registers. You know, we all do risk management. Anybody who runs a large organization is required to figure out, you know, what are the, what are the threats? What are the risks? Uh, you know, how can I manage down the probability and impact of the major risks? Um, but there's, there, there isn't the same formal exercise in terms of oppor an opportunity register, although obviously people do look for opportunities. Um, but any, any, any change uh, can be an opportunity. And you know, who wouldn't want to live in a world that was better organized, that, uh, where the energy supply was clean, green and limitless, um, you know, where you could have fresh water and fresh air and, uh, and a healthy life. So I think that's the way to look at it. You, you need to imagine what um, would be a much better way of organizing and running ourselves and then figure out how to get from A to B. Do you believe that the actions of one person or a community the size of Guildford or even the UK with its 66 million population in a world of 7 billion can really make much of a difference? Well, there's one answer to that at present, and that's Greta Thunberg. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, those of us that have been trying to tell this story for, for 30 years just uh, stand back in awe of a 16-year-old <laughs> Scandinavian schoolgirl who could have drawn the level of attention and engagement uh, on this subject that she has. Now, where all of that school's movement and so on goes is uh, an interesting discussion, but yes, and any you know, human history shows that individuals can make a huge difference. Um, but if, if we back up a little bit and just say, let's take uh, UK PLC, um, the UK can be proud of the fact that it innovated in 2008 with the Climate Change Act. That was the first attempt by any political system, by any nation anywhere in the world to recognize, acknowledge, and try and overcome the short-termism that's built into the democratic uh, cycle, mm -hmm. where governments come and go uh, on a four or five year um, cycle or rhythm, whereas we have to look to the future over 
you know, 40, 50, 100, 1,000 years in the decision making that, uh, that, that we're making. And so the Climate Change Act, by um, uh, creating this independent body, which uh, environment ministers and the government are legally obliged to listen to and um, uh, create and adopt policies that um, uh, respond to the advice given by this body, uh, is is a great innovation and in other nations there are other nations that are trying to um, to copy that so the UK may only be one or two percent of total emissions and so the planet would not notice if the UK shut down tomorrow which of course it may do um, but that's a whole other story um, uh, but uh, but our influence around the world can be um, very large and and it's interesting that uh, I'll give you another example uh, the Environment Agency uh, produced a plan to protect the London floodplain against flooding. It's called the Thames Estuary 2100 plan. And the people who uh, created that plan were struggling with the fact that there's always um, scientific uncertainty about exactly how much sea level rise and how much rainfall to expect in the future. I mean, the greatest uncertainty actually doesn't come from the, the um, physical models of the climate system. It comes from the assumptions about what human beings will actually do over the future in terms of pumping out CO2 and so on. <clears throat> but inevitably, there's uncertainty. And so they said, you know, there will always be <clears throat> irreducible uncertainty. So let's, let's just accept that. And we'll adopt a <clears throat> what they called an adaptive pathways plan where they, they incrementally, if you like, follow what the planet is doing, having ready a very well prepared set of options which they can mix and match to best match what they see as the problem at a given time. So, so that was a very clever way of overcoming the paralysis that others have suffered from where they said, well, the science is very uncertain. Perhaps if we wait another year or two, the scientists will be able to come back with a, a clearer picture. Well, in the end, that's, you know, that's never going to happen. There's always going to be the fog of war. So that adaptive pathways approach uh, overcame that problem. It's a really good plan. And other cities around the world, New York, Amsterdam, and so on, said, hey, that's very clever. And so they've adopted that approach. So, so again, it's it, you know, British thinking and innovation. You know, we have a, an, we're lucky to have a really good education system and university system. We have bright people who, who stand well in the world, uh, you know, ratings. Uh, and sure enough, they come up with good ideas. So Britain has actually had a good effect in terms of demonstrating uh, innovation in, in uh, addressing this question. Uh, uh, absolutely. And, and, you know, having, you know, science is an international um, profession. And so having spent, what, 40 years in science, um, around the world. Obviously, there are bright people everywhere, um, but the UK has a very high standing in, in the global effort to understand how the climate system works and what to do about it. And it's seen as a source of a lot of innovations and, uh, and original thinking. It's also been said that the changes that need to happen won't happen at the pace that they need to happen unless government policy forces change. Indeed, some are suggesting that democracy may not be up to the task and that more autocratic forms of government will be the answer. What's your view on that? Yeah, that's a very interesting, um, interesting point. I mean, first of all, I agree. <clears throat> the problem we have is that the pace and scale doesn't match the need at present. There's a, there's a huge amount going on and there's a huge amount going on that people don't know about because, uh, you know, the media simply don't cover it. I, I see that all the time. But... Um, <clears throat> it has to be a combination of uh, government action, regulation um, and incentives as well as uh, individual actions in businesses and people. But, but uh, for it all to work, um, it has all got to be coherent. So <clears throat> we've seen uh, so many examples, even in the last uh, couple of months, where governments have attempted to take action that's related to uh, climate change, raising the uh, cost of fuel in particular. Um, and poor people and other people, uh, that affects their lives in a dramatic way, and they riot. I mean, you know, Chile, um, uh, in France, President Macron, 
uh, hadn't prepared the ground adequately, the gilet jaune came out. I mean, often it's a combination of factors, this sort of seething resentment for lots of reasons. And then this just tips the, uh, tips the point. So uh, it, it, does an autocracy do that better? I, I don't think so, actually. I think you need a proper functioning democracy where people can, uh, people, the, 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 you know, the people who live in the nation can have an intelligent conversation about the issue and can work with business, government, um, civil society to, to move forward in a constructive way. Now, having said that, it's certainly true that the Chinese have done really well um, because they can set a five-year plan. When they set it, they're confident they're going to deliver it, A, because they always set their targets just slightly above what they think they're actually going to be able to do, but B, because uh, once they've set the target, you know, you better meet your piece of it or you're in trouble. And, uh, and we've seen them, uh, you know, they are the leading uh, producers and users of solar PV because they, they, they knew what needed to be done and they set that as a target. And, um, and so they have some advantages. Um, but in the end, if you don't have the permissions of people, then uh, top-down policy won't work. It'll, it'll run into the buffers at some point. Do you think there's a realistic chance that new technologies, such as carbon capture, will come to our rescue? Well, it, 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 in the long term, it will help. Um, but if you talk to people uh, who understand energy systems and, um, and the realities, they say, unless something is very close to market already, um, it's not going to help us on the time scale and to the scale that we want. Now, it, you, and, and, I, and I think that is basically true. On the other hand, who would have expected um, the uh, battery technology to advance in the way that it has, uh, you know, mainly driven by Elon Musk and, and you know, entrepreneurs like that. <clears throat> so there are some things that, you know, judging what is actually close to market is a tough thing to do. I guess I'd be a millionaire if I were really good at that because I would have invested in it. Um, uh, but, if, but if we're talking about nuclear fusion or you know, third or fourth generation uh, nuclear fission uh, or exotic um, schemes to do uh, geothermal extraction in deep water, you know, in the end, I think those things will come to market, but they're not close enough yet to be big players in what, what's necessary in the short term. Mm. So in addition to new technologies, we need to change our behaviors. Yes, yes. Um, on the subject of technologies, uh, in your role as chair of the European Space Agency's High-Level Science Policy Advisory Committee, yes. <laughs> you've been directly involved in encouraging European scientific collaboration. Uh, what do you think the impact of Brexit will be on the development of sustainable technologies in the UK? Disastrous. And, and look, Elon Musk uh, made his decision uh, last week, didn't he, that his gigafactory. Uh, now, I, you know, whether you think that we need electric cars in the future is a whole other issue. But it's a brilliant example that, um, you know, he's planted it in Europe because he wants to take advantage of uh, all the supply chain and uh, administrative and bureaucratic and um, uh, all the other issues that a large integrated market like Europe offers. So uh, Britain is insane to walk away from that. It'll be hugely damaging. Uh, somebody said the other day that, um, when was it, June the 23rd, 2016, we went to bed as Great Britain and the next morning we woke up as Little England and uh, I think that's true. Uh, finally, as I mentioned in your introduction, in 2014, supported by the Royal Court Theatre, you wrote and performed a one-man show called 2071. Can you tell us a little bit more about this play and the significance of the title? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I, I had come to realise uh, several things. Firstly, that theatre, uh, uh, attacking multiple senses simultaneously, and theatre does that, um, is a very powerful way of connecting rather than simply giving a lecture. Uh, a, a, a dialogue is better, but if, if you're going to radiate uh, something to an audience, then theatre is a, is a clever way of doing it. Uh, not least because the audience has, uh, has bought into the contract, they've bought a ticket uh, for their seat, and so they have given permission to have an experience that they might not otherwise have. Um, but secondly, uh, it allowed me to operate in the informed citizen mode. So rather than as the professional climate scientist where uh, there are certain uh, norms of, of behavior and, and uh, constraints 
on how you deliver information. You, you, you um, always have to be completely impartial. There's this long tradition that you try and eliminate emotion because that might imply that, it, uh, that your impartiality is impure in some way. Um, so it allowed me to, uh, to essentially take off my jacket, sit on the stage, have a fireside chat, because I know stuff. I've spent 40 years um, involved in this story, paid for by the public purse primarily. So actually I see it as an obligation to, um, to tell people what I know, but also what I think and feel about it. So the, 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 the theatrical circumstance allowed me in an off-duty mode, like you know, being down the pub or over a glass mm -hmm. of wine to say, do you know what, if you want the formal stuff, you know, I can give that to you with all the graphs and so on. But if you just want to hear uh, how I got into this, uh, what it's done to me, what I think about it, where I think we're going, what keeps me up, you know, awake at night, uh, then come along and listen. And so that, that was an engaging uh, way of delivering a slightly different story from the one I would normally do. But the 2071 was chosen because my eldest granddaughter was 10 years old when I wrote the play. And um, she will be the age that I was when I wrote the play in 2071. So it gave us a bridge with somebody real uh, into the future. Um, she, as we pointed out in the play, will be breathing air in 2071 that will have some molecules of carbon dioxide in it that we generated uh, on the evening of the performance. You know, people traveling there, people, the lights, the sound and all the rest of it. So it opens up a question about intergenerational justice. And I think that it goes back to my abolish fossil fuels. It seems to me that the framing of watch the framing of uh, the climate science story shift from being a, a science story, you know, it's all to do with graphs and measurements and predictions and modeling, uh, which generated a technocratic story about, oh, well, we can use wind and solar and, and then an industrial story about how we do that in a way which is cost competitive and then an economic story, which was largely negative because it uh, instinctively um, the ideologues of neoliberalism could see that to deal with this, you need um, legislation, you need, um, uh, you know, you need to uh, constrain what society and business can do, you need to do it in an internationally coordinated way, and that's, uh, and that's a complete anathema to their religion. So we had this big pushback from the, uh, the neoliberals, and you know, you know who they are, and 70% of the newspapers are owned by those people, so you, that's why you get these banner headlines, you know, climate science is untrue. Um, but it's shifted more recently to a human story and a story of, uh, of justice. And Mary Robinson, who, uh, you know, the ex-president of Ireland, who's been a fighter uh, for justice all her life, recently said that the, the penny dropped about 10 years ago, that the, the biggest injustice is to leave future generations a badly damaged planet and a badly damaged um, society. Because, uh, you know, climate science is a threat multiplier and it just makes all of the other turbulence on the planet a lot worse. So she said that, in, that intergenerational injustice is the framing injustice into which all other um, justice issues fits. So that's the one that we need to fight. So 2071 was essentially accepting that frame and then the way it was delivered was sort of within that frame. Um, and that was it. So telling the human story. Yeah, telling the human story with somebody that I can, you know, she exists, I can imagine her, um, <clears throat> and saying, what legacy are we going to leave her? Professor Chris Rapley, thank you very much again for giving us your time today. Yeah, my pleasure.